Good morning. Welcome here. Uh, my name is Jeff, uh, one of the pastors here at Grace Evergreen, and I am just so glad that you are here this morning. So glad that we get to open up the Word of God and, uh, and to see what He has to teach us this morning. I love that. We are still in the book of Philippians for a few more weeks. We're getting to the end of it. So we are going to keep looking at Philippians as a reminder. This is a, a letter that was written by a man named Paul. Paul was an eyewitness to, to Jesus, what Jesus had, had done. And he had, had planted a bunch of churches. And so uh, this church in Philippi that he's writing this letter to, he had planted that church. Now he's writing them this letter to encourage them. So he is in, in prison. Presently, as he's writing this letter, he's in Rome in prison, and he's writing this letter to them. And as you can see, the kind of the subtitle that we have for our, our theme for this whole book is a reason for joy. And I, just, I, I love that theme because Paul is in prison, and he's got this reason for joy. And we saw that last week, this idea of, of just praising God in all circumstances, and I love that. So uh, we are in Philippians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to, to flip them open to get to that passage. Philippians chapter 4. We're looking at verses 8 and 9 this morning. So there are only two verses. You might think, wow, this is going to be a, a short sermon. I'm glad you thought that. That's probably not the case. There's so much good stuff in here that we're going to dig into today. So what we're going to actually look at is in these two verses, there are, there are two things that Paul is calling the church to do, two kind of commands to do, and then it ends with this incredible promise, this, this reminder. What, what, I, what I love about Scripture, and we, and we just see that again this morning, one of the coolest things about the Bible is all these letters, these, these books were written by different people. And we were thinking maybe specifically about these letters, that they were written, yeah, they were written for a specific group of people. They were written for the churches they were to, but they weren't just for those churches. See, they were written through the Holy Spirit, and then because of that, they are for us today. So everything that we see in Scripture is for us. It's for us as a church. This is the living Word of God, and we can read it, and we can know it because this is for us today, and it applies to us. So as we read it, as we listen to it, we know that, that what we're seeing in here, it's not just for the church in Philippi. This is not just Paul's instructions for them, because through the Holy Spirit, the church, this is for us today. So as we read this, we know that, let's know that what is written here is for grace evergreen. This is for us this morning. So we're going to listen to our scripture passage, these two verses. And after those, those passages, I'm going I'm to pray, and then we're just going to dive in to see what, what the Holy Spirit has to teach us this morning in this passage. So let's listen to the scripture passage together. Reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I'm just going to pray and then we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, we are just grateful for this. We are grateful for your word, that we can read it today and know that it is for us. So, Spirit, would you just, just speak to us this morning? Jesus, we are so grateful for this, for this passage we have in here. And so, yeah, we just ask you to, to speak to us, to, to, that we would just see you through this passage. And we would leave here just praising you and loving you more. Amen. One of the first things that we see in this passage in, in verse 8, that one of the very, the very first word Paul says is he says, finally, brothers, or and finally, brothers and sisters, it can be too. But he has this word, finally. So again, we saw this a, a couple chapters ago, a few weeks ago, we looked at this where Paul had this word as well. He said, finally, and that, and that we, we, we learned that that wasn't really the end, but he was tying up some loose ends. But we know now, we can see this because we know this letter is winding up when Paul starts off this, this 
part and he says, says, finally, we know that he is actually winding everything up. So he's, he's giving these final kind of exhortations. He's giving the, the final uh, commands, these final things as he's winding up this letter. In fact, we have just two more weeks of it, and we're going to, those weeks, we're actually going to look at in, in the rest of this, of, of chapter four, is, is Paul just kind of thanking the church for what they have done, thanking them for the gifts they've given him, and he just ends off with those kind of a things. But, but right now, he's ending off with, with finally, and then he's giving them these, these final exhortations. So he's writing this letter, and this is coming from, from Paul, this, this pastor, this, this church planter. And as he's writing this letter, he's just laying it out. Okay, at the very end now, I just want you guys to see and just to know these things. Now, then he lists, and we heard it as it was, as it was read, a number of different things that he is telling them to do. He's telling them to, to think about these things. Now, this, this verse may be familiar to you. If you, if you grew up in the church, maybe you, you've heard this passage before. Maybe you've You've memorized it. It's a, it's, a, it's a good passage to memorize. Maybe if you went to Sunday school or, or Bible camp, chances are that you, maybe you memorize this. I think I, at one point, memorized this, this passage. And, and, uh, and we think about that. I, I know somebody who actually had this passage and they, they, they put it on a big piece of paper beside their, their TV and by their computer as a reminder for what they see, just to think about those kind of things. But it, it's a great verse and it's an important command that we have here from Paul. And, and it, was, it wasn't just added in here. Paul just didn't throw this out here and, and give him this because it sounded nice, because it's, it's, it's a good passage, because he's like, you know what, this is a, a great thing that people can put on, on T-shirts or coffee mugs, and so I'm going to give them this passage that they can just do that with, but he, he really wanted them to do something with. He, he understands that there's a, an important aspect of here that he wants the church to think about and to do. So Paul's command here in verse 8 is to think about these things. He wants them to, to, to think on these things. And the, the human mind, when we think about the things that we think about, when we think about the human mind and how, how incredibly complex it is, you know, sometimes it's, it's compared to, to a computer, right? You might compare the human mind. But we know that the human mind is infinitely more complex and greater than, than the greatest computer ever designed. The human mind is this incredible thing. As I was doing some reading and looking, and I don't know who thinks of these things, so I, I didn't make up the stat. I just found it somewhere. And I don't know if it's true or not. The average person thinks about, has about 10,000 separate different thoughts every single day. 10,000 thoughts. Again, I don't know who counts these things or who thinks of these things, but that's, that's what, I, what I found. 10,000 thoughts every day. So that's like 3.6 million, more than 3.6 million thoughts in a year. Most of you have had about 2,000 thoughts already this morning. And depending on how well you pay attention, even during this time, you might have about three or 400 more as I'm up here. So hopefully you only have one or two as you're listening to what I'm saying and not three or 400. That's the power of our, of our thoughts, the, the power and, and, and the, the variety of the things that we, we think about. And so Paul is giving them this important list. He says, this is, this is a list of things that I want you to, to think about these things. Because we know that we think about so many different things. Our minds can wander. We can think about so many different things. Paul's like, think about these things. Even as we look in Scripture, we see Jesus talked a lot about our thoughts and the importance of our thoughts. Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. Look, look at what it says in in the Gospel of Mark, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. These are, these are thoughts that people have. And so Jesus is, is recognizing the power that we have in, in our thoughts. In the Sermon on the Mount that we have, Jesus talked about our thoughts. He talked about adultery, right? He talked about how adultery begins with lust, the thought of lust. He talked about murder and, and hate, the thought of, of hate that can all be traced to these thoughts. See, what we think 
matters. And I think it matters more than we think, if you understand what I just said. See, the author of Hebrews even tells us that, that, that no creature, nothing is hidden from God's sight. Hebrews 4.13 says this. So that may maybe scare you a little bit, but it's a good reminder for us that God, God sees us and he, he knows our thoughts. There, there is a battle that happens with our mind, with our, with our thoughts and in our minds. See, the enemy wants, wants nothing more than for our, our minds just to wander. Just to let our minds wander, to think about whatever comes to your mind. And with all the thoughts that we think about every day, if it is 10,000 thoughts, with all these thoughts, the opportunity for us to allow our minds to wander. See, how many of our thoughts may not fit into the list that Paul gives? If you think about the thoughts that you have, like what, how many of them you think fit into this list? How many of them are, are, are true and honorable and, and pure and just and, and commendable? How, how many fit into that? See, I think the danger that we get into when we think about our thoughts, when it comes to our thoughts, is that no one knows what we're thinking, do they? No one knows what we're thinking, so we're almost we're free to think about whatever we want. Nobody can, can hear our thoughts, unless you're Mel Gibson. Right? And he could hear what, what women thought of him. You guys remember that movie, what women want? Mel Gibson could hear women's thoughts. Maybe you guys don't remember that movie. But he could hear what women thought. Anyway, it's a side note. I just thought of that now. But sometimes we get stuck into thinking that nobody can, can hear our thoughts. Nobody can see them anyway. So right, we're free to think whatever we want. Because no one's going to know that. But we see in scripture that, that, that God knows our thoughts. See, we're really what we need is we need to, to, to keep our thoughts in check. And so Paul is giving them this reminder of what to think about. And we need God's word just to saturate our minds that we may be renewed and kept from wrong thinking. And that's why it's important for us as believers to, to read God's word. See, there's so much power in our thoughts that it's important to keep them in check. So Paul tells us what to think about. He knows the dangers of our thoughts. And so he finishes with this letter. He's getting to the end. Right? He says, finally, and he knows the power of our thoughts. He wants to help them by directing their thoughts to these certain things, to this list. And he gives us this interesting list. And even what's more interesting to me is, is even where we can find these things in this list. There's a place I think we can see them. We can find this list. And as we see this list, of these things in verse 8 that Paul is calling us to, we get this impression, or we make, maybe I just get it. Now, I used to have this impression that he's calling on them. He's, he's like to give their minds this. And I think that's part of it too. It really is part of it, what he's asking them to do. And just to think about these things. And, and that's true. He's calling them to think about these things. And that's why our minds and our thoughts are so important. He's like, just think about all of these things that are, that are there. But the Greek word originally, when how this was written... Is, is a little bit different than to just think. The word that Paul used actually means to, to consider or, or to take, take into account. And so he's telling them these things to consider these things or to take into account with these things rather than simply to think about literally we are to consider these things. And so I see that there's maybe two sides of this. So part of it is, is, is to is to think about these things, to have our minds set on these things that are in here. But it's also not just a command just to sit quietly by ourselves and to say, okay, you know what, I, I'm just going to think pure thoughts now, or I'm just going to think about what's, what's lovely. And, I, and you know what, there is a time for that, and I think that's important too. But if we consider that, what he's writing here, to consider these things, consider what is pure, what is, what is excellent, or take into account what is excellent, I think we can do that in what we see around us. See, what I think what Paul is getting at is they, they can also follow this list, they can take into account with what they see around them, as long as it conforms to Christ. See, this list that Paul wrote to them 
they may see in various places in their culture. See, because God is the, the creator and the, and the giver of all good gifts, we, we shouldn't be surprised to find things that are excellent or things that are, that are praiseworthy in our, in our world. And to be honest, as, as I studied this and looked at this, I, I was surprised because I saw this come out in a number of different commentaries that kept bringing out this idea of, of, of Paul even using this list to point to the world around him, to our culture around them. And see, I'd always thought, and I think it still is, an introspective thing where we do need to think about these things, but I think there's also this idea where we can see this in places around us. See, we do need to, to, to focus our mind on these things, and that's part of it, but we can see these things in other places. See, the, the list that Paul gives, it points to the believers, to the beauty that we see in the world around us. One of the reasons I think Paul is doing this is to encourage the believers, to encourage the church in Philippi, that even though they are presently citizens of heaven, and he's told them that they are citizens of heaven, that they don't need to altogether abandon the world in which they live. See, as believers, we can enjoy the best that the world has as long as it's understood in the lens, through the lens of the gospel. This is, and I, I think what, what he's getting at here is they can consider excellent things that they find in their surrounding culture. And, and, and I, you know, I may be wrong on this, but I think we have this, you know, a, there's a possibility that there's, there's a teaching here that we're free to enjoy the good things around us, even though they don't come from an, an explicitly Christian source. See, we can appreciate the truth and beauty that we see in, in the arts. In, in literature, in, in science, technology, in, in sports, even if it's produced in, through unbelievers. See, we can look at our world and see these things. And if we, we sift it through the, the lens of Scripture, we can still be, see the goodness of these things. And I think Paul does this because when we do this, when we consider these things, when we look at the world and we see these things, we see things that are excellent and things that are, that are praiseworthy because they point us to God. So he says, think about these things. And so we're in our world and we see these beautiful things happening or these cool things happening. And if we should just praise God for that. And so what Paul is doing is, says, you guys, think about these things because I know if you think about these things, you're just going to praise your heavenly father. So he's giving them a reason to praise their father, to consider the beauty of a painting, the, the beauty of a book, to consider the excellence of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And we just praise God for that. Can, can, we, can we do that? Can we see the, the beauty in that? And it causes us to praise God. Yeah, I know this list is about what we think about and what we consider. When we do need to, to guard our minds, and that's such an important aspect of this. We need to be careful what we put into our minds and what we watch and what we look at. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge part of this here. But we can also see the beauty, see things that are excellent outside of that too. One of the ways we, we avoid uh, thinking like the world and guarding our hearts is through the renewing of our mind. In, in Paul. His, his letter to the Romans, Romans 12, 2, he said this, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, what Paul is doing is he's encouraging us to ponder, to think on, to consider that the God of the Bible, all of the God of the Bible finds worthy of our thoughts and to think biblically in, in, in a Christ-centered, Christ-exalting way but all the things that we see in the world. Can we, can we see the, the, in a Christ-centered way the beauty in the world? He says, whatever is true, think about this. Consider that not, not, not what is false, not, not thinking about lies that you may have heard, but just th having your minds thinking about what is true, what is honorable, not, not dishonorable. He's talking about things that are, that are worthy of honor. 
to consider that, to take into account what is honorable, to what is, what is just. Right? Not, not unjust, not, not wrong, but things that are right to things that are just. Pure. Not defiled, but clean and wholesome. Whatever is commendable, that's a, that's a, that's a good report, right? And their accommodations, it's a good report, something that is done well. Excellence. Is there any excellence? This describes this moral goodness, this, this virtue, this nobility. Worthy of praise. That, that maybe is an easier one. Is, is, what is worthy of praise? Things that are worthy of, of recognition. What makes you stand up and applaud? This is what we are to consider. What is true, good, excellent, pure, all these things. It's not merely just in the eyes of the beholder. That which we are to uh, uh, think on as well. These, these must measure up though, through the gospel of Jesus and his work to make, make all things new. So when we think about what is pure, when we, we think about what is excellent, it should never contradict the image of Christ. So we must sift everything through the gospel. But Paul wants us to take into account, to consider this, to, to think about them. See, if our minds are on these things, if we're looking in our world for things that are, that are, that are pure and honorable and commendable and, and just, if we're, if we're thinking about these things, then our minds are less prone to wander. Because we're, we're looking, for, looking for things to praise Jesus with. Because these things, when we see them, it should cause us to praise our Heavenly Father for that, for what we see. It should cause us to praise Him when we see that. This is the encouragement that I think Paul has for the church. To, 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 to think about these things and in turn give our praise to God. That's, I think that's what he's getting at here. So that's this command that he gives at the beginning to think. Now let's let our, look at our next verse in verse 9. And there's a command to do. So this passage is has got something to, to think on and something to do. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says... What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, if it sounds a bit familiar, it's because uh, Paul actually said something really similar to it just a few, uh, few verses back. Chapter 3, verse 17, Paul said this. He said, brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So Paul wasn't afraid to tell others to follow him. He's like, okay, you've seen me. You, you know me, all the things that I, I've taught you now. Now put these things into practice, what you've seen of me, what you've, what you've heard from me, what I've taught with you. Paul's heart is he wants, he wants the church to follow godly examples. And his, his concern throughout this letter as he's writing this letter to the Philippians is the gospel. And specifically, his concern is, is living out the gospel in the world around them. It's living out the gospel in a way that others see what you're doing. And so it's so important here that he, that he ends when he says, finally, brothers, and he's giving this final exhortation. He says, practice these things. I want you to practice these things. I want you to do these things because it's so important when we're talking about the gospel that we live out the gospel, that we live out what we have seen, what we, have, what we know, what we have heard, what we have read, that we live that out so the world sees that. And in this verse, there's these four ways which he has given teachings to his, his readers. First, he says to follow the teachings that they had learned from him. See, prior to writing this letter, most likely these are the teachings Paul had, had, had given to them. Remember, he, he had actually been there and he had seen them face to face. And so he's saying to them, to uh, what you have learned from me, put into practice. He had been there. He had talked to them. Then he says, what you have received from me. Again, this is part of the teaching thing. It's, it can come in through the letters as well, that they had received letters from him. Paul says, put into practice what I've received from me. Third, they are to follow what they had heard from Paul. Again, this could be the writings and his teachings. All of these things would, would have been 
equally authoritative. But Paul is just like, you know, even what you, what you heard from me. Then the fourthly, they are to follow what they have seen in Paul. Paul was an example of this, this living teaching tool to the Philippian believers. So what he is calling to do is to put into practice. And as, you know, these, these instructions aren't meant to be just known. They aren't meant to just be read, okay, I know one and agree to. They, they are meant to be put into action. See, in the word practice that Paul uses here, it's not just a short-term thing, right? It's not just a one-term, one-time thing. We go practice it, now we're good, we're going to go on. But this, this word actually implies an ongoing daily effort, not a, not a one-time, short-term kind of thing. There's a daily effort. This is something that we continually work at. The, the idea of, of putting something into practice and, and training is something we see in other parts of Scripture as well. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 said, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Then verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. There's this training that happens, that continues to happen. See, once we become a, a follower of Jesus, once you are a believer, we don't automatically stop sinning. That's just not, not how it works. So wouldn't that be great if that's how it happened? But it doesn't happen that way. We've got to continually to work at it. Paul says, look at how I lived. Look at all the things that I had taught you, all these things, and put them into practice. Practice these things. And even this term, I just want to clarify, put into practice. This is not like the term practice. He doesn't say practice these things. But he says, put into practice these things. Last week, you know, the week before, I, I went to go watch the, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders practice. They were practicing here. Their training camp was happening here in Saskatoon. So I went down and I got to watch them practice. They were running different drills and doing different things. But it was only a practice. It was not, not a game, right? It wasn't a game. So they were just practicing these things. So this phrase, put into practice actually has more of a thing of, 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 of doing, to, to do these things. And in fact, there are a couple translations that we see in the Bible where it actually does say, do these things, not put into practice. So the meaning here is actually similar to, to a doctor. You go see a doctor who, a doctor who, who practices medicine, right? They, when they practice medicine, they're, they're applying all that they've learned in medical school. Or a lawyer, a lawyer practices law, you know, all that they've been taught, that they learned, you know, in, in law school. They're not, pra they're not practicing in the sense that, that we think of a practice, but they are doing that. So Paul says to put into practice, to do what we have learned and read and seen and heard, all these things. James said this, chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, he says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only. So we have this reminder even from, from James to, to put into practice the things that we've seen, that we've known. But James says, like, just be, don't, don't just be hearers. Don't just hear what, you, what, you, what you've been taught and just stay there with it, but actually do it. It should cause action with it too. There's a reminder here to put into practice these things. What I, what I love about this passage is I, we see like these, these two sides of our, of our Christian life as believers. There's this thought life that is, that is not seen by others, right? So this is the unseen thing, but we know is so important. What we think, right? Jesus talked about this, what we think, kind of uh, out of what we think out of our mind come all of these things. And so our thought life is so important. So we need to guard that. We need to protect what we think. And so Paul gives us a list of things that we're, we're able to, to, to think, to ponder on, to, to find praiseworthy, whether it's, you know, just thinking about pure things or maybe we see things and are reminded about the goodness of God. So we have this part of this letter that Paul gives in this 8 and 9 is, is this thinking part, is, is this unseen part. And then the other side of things is this outward life, which is just equally as important. This thinking and doing side of things that Paul is getting at here. 
So in these verses, Paul is telling the church to, to think on these things, to, to practice these things. Both, thing, both things seen and things unseen. Did you see that? This is what Paul is calling us to. Things that are seen and things that are unseen. And then the end of verse 9, this is that promise. Let's, let's look at it again. Verse 9, at the end of it says, And the God of peace will be with you. This, this phrase, God of peace, is, is seen actually lots in, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament scriptures, we see this phrase used lots. And I think this is a, a favorite phrase of Paul because Paul uses this phrase, uses this, this wording of, of peace so often in his letters. This is a reminder that he wants us to know. So Paul is given these, these commands of what he wants, how he wants them to think, what they, what they are to do. Then he concludes with this promise of peace. And in a way, this is, this is almost like a benediction, a way to close this letter, that the God of peace will be with them. And the cool thing is, is that they, they get peace. They get, they get the God of peace. They get this peace because, because God, by and through his spirit, is, is in their midst. Because as believers, if we have the Holy Spirit, then we have God. And if we have God, then we have his peace. I think this is a great reminder for us as believers. That, that the God of peace is with us. So we, we, don't, we don't talk often about, about peace. It, maybe we talk about it peace in, in, in a bigger sense, in, in a world sense, right? Where we look at things that are happening around us and we, we maybe pray for peace or, or want peace to happen. But we don't talk a lot. Maybe, maybe we don't talk enough about, about this this personal, this inward peace that we can have as believers. In two verses back, so like just last week we saw this. Look at what he said in, in verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's just something incredible that that Paul wants us to know here. That we can have peace in the midst of, of hard times, in the midst of, of, of uncertainty, of not knowing what's going to happen, of, of stress. That, that our Heavenly Father is a God of peace. He's a God of peace. And we, and we get this peace as it says in verse 7, this peace that surpasses all understanding. There's no way to explain it, no way to understand it. It surpasses all understanding that we, we get that as believers. And as a result, Paul says that followers of Jesus get God's peace. The prophet Isaiah wrote, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 26, verse 3, he says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you in perfect peace because he trusts in you. How true that is, hey? So let's set our minds on, on praiseworthy things, to, to think on things that are praiseworthy. Let's put into practice what we've been taught and know the incredible, perfect peace of God. But as we look at this list, and this is the yeah but, when we look at these lists, you guys, we know that we can't do it. We, we can't perfectly do that. We can't always think about what is true and what is pure and what is right. We don't always practice what we have seen and what we have heard and we have known. We don't always do this, do we? We mess up so often. Maybe every day. We're not always thinking what we should be. We don't always think about what is pure. But there was one who did. There's one who, who did all of this perfectly. When we see this list, it should remind us that, yeah, we're going to fail. We're, we're still supposed to strive for this, but we're not going to hit it perfectly. But there was one who did. That's Jesus. 
when we, when we see this list, we should be reminded of Jesus and what he has done. Let's put Jesus' name into this list. Look, 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 look what it does for us. Finally, brothers, Jesus is true. Jesus is honorable. Jesus is just. Jesus is pure. Jesus is lovely. Jesus is commendable. If there's any excellence, it's Jesus. That Jesus is worthy of praise. Think on these things. Think on, on, on Jesus. See, even Paul, if we look at verse 9, when he, when he calls the church to, 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 to do what he has done, to what he has taught, what he has done for them, remember what he said in, in 1 Corinthians? We, we looked at this a couple weeks ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He's not really, in a sense, calling them to follow him. In 11 verse 1, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So in a sense, we're not following what Paul has done. We're following Jesus. So this is a call. This verses 8 and 9 are just a call to see Jesus. To, to think and to have us point to Jesus. To follow what he has done. So Paul calls us to do what he has done. But he's calling us to follow Jesus. See, these verses just point us to him. He is the one we are to think on, to consider. As, you know, as we see the, the different things in our world and in our culture, and they, should call, they should point us to him. As we put into practice, we, we do so following Jesus. And as we do these things, we do it remembering that the peace of God is with us. Church, this letter is for us. To, to, to think on these things, to, to, to guard our thoughts, to guard our thoughts by keeping them on these things and to see these things in our world and to praise our Father to them, to see Jesus in all of these things and to praise him for that, to put into practice what we've seen in Scripture and, and not just hearers of the word but doers of it, to imitate Christ in all of this, and to know that as we do it, and as we think this way, that the God of peace is with us. And that's such the perfect reminder. And that's like the perfect ending. That as we strive for this, we know we're not going not gonna to do it. We know we're going to fail. But we know that promise still holds true. That the God of peace is with us. And all of this. And we can just praise him. We continue to strive for it. We continue to, to, to make it our aim to do it. But we know that the God of peace is with us in all that. And I love that as we see this, we know that Jesus is this list. That Jesus has done all of this. And he has done all of that for us. So all this list, these things that he has done in here, this, this righteousness that he has, is ours as followers of Jesus. That, that his death, that he died for us, and his righteousness that he had becomes ours. That, that's what we get. We get Jesus and his righteousness for us. And that's peace, right? Knowing that we have that, that, that is peace that surpasses all understanding, knowing that we get Jesus and what he has done for us. What a great reminder we have. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this verse, for these verses. Thank you for how they just point us to you. We can just see you in it. We can even see you in our, in our world and cause us to praise you for what you have done. Thank you that you have saved us, that your righteousness becomes ours. These things that you have done, that we fail that, but you have done. And we praise you for what you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.